come for my son's body. Please give it to me. And the poet tells us that in a moment of empathy, strange for Achilles, he doesn't have much of this, but in a moment of empathy, he realizes that he himself someday may die and someone will want to take care of his body. And so in a moment of empathy, he gives the body of Patroclus back uh, I'm sorry, the body of Hector back to Priam. The body of Patroclus is also returned to Achilles. And the Iliad then will end with these burials, these, these very powerful moments of the funeral pyre burials. That's the end of the Iliad. The stories that will now follow are all what we call post-Iliadic stories. Of course, the two most famous are the tellings of the Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid, right? But before we get there, we have to tell about the fall of Troy. This great, this mighty city. The first of the post-Iliadic stories begins with the death of Achilles, however. But uh, Paris has been rehabilitating from his uh, injuries. Uh, and he comes out from his afternoon homework with Helen. And he takes a little walk along the uh, upper, you know, battlements. And, uh, you know, there's a soldier there, and he, hey, give me that, give me that bow and arrow set. I'm gonna... Paris shoots this arrow into the air. Uh, let's point out, Achilles sees the arrow coming as he's seen thousands of arrows come. He doesn't even think about it. But the arrow sticks into his heel. And for the first time in his life, Achilles feels pain. It's like, whoa, what is up with that? And then there's blood coming out of his ankle. Of course, we are aware that his mama, when she dipped him into the river Styx, she held on to his little ankle and dropped him in the water and brought him out. She didn't grab the other ankle and dip him a second time. Achilles has only one wounding place, and it's in that ankle, and he's never been wounded there before. We will, of course, metaphorically speak of the Achilles as being, the Achilles heel, as being that weakness that you possess, but you don't know that you possess it. Of course, in physiology, we speak of the Achilles for this very reason. Are you ready for this? The greatest warrior of all time dies from an arrow wound to his heel. And, Ach and Achilles dies. Well, the Greeks now are distraught. They're like, dude, we've been fighting for over 10 years. Now Achilles is dead. Let's just give up and go home. It, and it's important. It's Odysseus who says, I got a plan. This is what we're going to do. The Trojans are stupid. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to build this large wooden badger. I mean horse. This really large one. And 250 of us are going to crawl up inside this huge horse. And we're going to leave it outside the walls of Troy. All the rest of us are going to get on our ships and sail away like we quit. We're going to leave one guy here to lie. And he's going to say that the Greeks have quit now that Achilles is dead. And this horse is for good fortune. It's like a sacrifice to the gods. The Trojans are so stupid, Odysseus says, that they're going to push this horse inside of their own city. Under cover of night, we're going to crawl out of the horse. All the Greek strips are going to turn around and come back, and we'll slaughter all of them. Now, this ain't in the text, but I often have wondered maybe if this story happened. There's Odysseus in front of all the troops as he tells this. Walking. That's what we'll do, man. That's what we'll do. Some soldier raises his hand and goes, Ah, question, sir. Question. Yes, question. Uh, we're going to, like, build this horse. Right. Build a horse. And we're going to crawl inside of it. Right. Crawl inside of it. And we're going to tell the Trojans it's a sacrifice. Right. Sacrifice. And uh, don't most of the time sacrifices get burned? <laughs> Somehow or another, Odysseus does it. He convinces these guys to get inside along with himself. And sure enough, it works, man. Stupid Trojans. Aeneas will tell this story to Dido in the Aeneid. Stupid Trojans. They actually tear down part of their walls to get this large horse inside of their city for good luck. Under cover of night, oh, brutal. Under cover of night, the Greeks return. The Trojans start party hardying because they think the war is over. They take all the soldiers, take off their battle armor. They all start getting stoned. They're having a great party under cover of night. From out of that horse crawls Odysseus and his men. They open the gates of the city. And what happens next is one of the most horrific moments in history. The slaughter 
of the people of Troy. The Greeks have been waiting for over 10 years to do this. So they get ready to just jack the ever Terrible. They take young babies and throw them in the air and play catch with spears. They tear open the stomachs of pregnant women because they don't want the children to be born and grow up to fight against the Greeks. The streets run with blood, we're told. It's so horrific. King Priam, the king of Troy, realizes what's going on. He grabs his wife Hecuba and he says, come on, we got to get out of here. And he starts running through the city. The walls have been already, uh, the houses are already on fire, smoke everywhere, people screaming, and they're running through the city. And Pir uh, Priam kind of loses his bearings. And, he, uh, and all of a sudden he looks up and there's this great warrior named Pyrrhus, we're told. Dressed in complete black armor, he's so enraged that his eyes are like red. For those of you who know Jimmy Cameron's uh, the uh, Terminator series, you know now where some of that came from. Red eyes, and he's covered in blood and guts, and he's got this huge sword, this big man. And he sees King Priam, and he screams at him, Priam! And Priam, like a rabbit, we're told, like a rabbit that's frightened. He turns, and he takes Hecuba, his wife, and he starts running down a street. It's a dead-end street. He's got nowhere to go. When Pyrrhus turns and starts walking down the street towards Priam, we're told Priam falls to his knees, Hecuba, his wife, standing behind him, she starts crying, weeping, and Pyrrhus walks up, Priam begging for his life. We're told that Pyrrhus looks at him with those red, enraged eyes. He raises his huge sword over his head, and he brings it right down on top of the head of old man Priam. But right before he hits the skull, he stops. And the entire city of Troy, we're told, goes dead silent. And through the mind of King Priam, flashes of thought, not Opu, flashes of thought, a memory. Memory? What memory? What memory would old man Priam, king of Troy, have right before he gets jacked? Memory of the night. In that same town, the city of Troy, on a stormy evening when a little boy was born to him named Paris. And he was told, you better kill that kid or he will be the end of your great city. That's the thought. That's the memory. That final thought of Priam is, oh, it happened. The gods got their way. And then we're told Pyrrhus splits open the head of, uh, of uh, Priam like a grapefruit. Takes Hecuba and off she goes to stand in line with all of the other women of Troy who will be taken as prize. Two other issues though. First, question. What are you going to do with the young infant son of Hector, the greatest of the Trojan warriors? Odysseus says... He'll grow up to avenge his father's death. We have to kill him. And so to the high, high walls of Troy, that small boy is taken and he's thrown off the walls of Troy, his little body tumbling down to the rocks below. And that's the end of Hector's line. His wife is taken and she's also put in that line. The... Story that follows is the story of Aeneas. Aeneas is an interesting cat. He doesn't party that night. He doesn't. He sits in his room uh, in full body armor. When we come back tomorrow, that's where we'll pick up with the story of Aeneas. Thank you.